very good morning everybody so as we know there are four branches of orthodontics starting with preventive orthodontics in which we try to prevent any malocclusion from setting in so we perform a precautionary orthodontics so that no malocclusion sets in then we have interceptive orthodontics wherein the malocclusion has set in however before it worsens we intercept at an early age then the third one is corrective orthodontics where a full bone malocclusion has already set in and we need full orthodontics that means a brace is treatment probably to correct it and fourth is your surgical orthodontics which actually deals with correction of your jaw bases skeletal problem with surgery orthognathic surgery which is generally done in adults non growing individuals and today's lecture is going to be on interceptive orthodontics so just for an example suppose we have a mesiodense between the two central incisors however it has caused no harm on our dentition presently and we notice it in our iopa and we decide to remove that supernumerary tooth so this would be a part of your preventive orthodontics however the same procedure when it is performed after it has already erupted the mesodens and it has caused periodontium loss and it is almost hitting the central incisor right here so that means it has started causing harm and we want to prevent it from causing further harm and intercept at an early age by getting it removed then the same procedure will be called as interceptive orthodontics so the idea is it is the timing which is making it fall in a different branch and the same procedure when it is done at this stage where it has actually erupted fully and it has caused a middle line diastema once i remove it and the patient might need full braces treatment to close the gap which has come then this becomes a part of corrective orthodontics and finally this one where the maxilla is comparatively retrognathic mandible is prognathic and patient is having a class 3 skeletal base with no growth left as the patient is an adult then this patient would need surgical correction so this will be a part of surgical orthodontics so let's concentrate on the procedures that come under interceptive orthodontics so at the end of the lecture you should be able to of course define what it means what are the different procedures which come under the same and a special note to serial extraction its advantages disadvantages the types and also the muscle exercises so we start with the definition so basically the procedures which are undertaken at an early stage of malocclusion to eliminate or minimize its severity so the malocclusion has set in but we we are going to start our orthodontic procedures and not let it worsen we are going to minimize the effects by starting early intercepting at an early age so there are broadly seven procedures which come under your interceptive orthodontic procedures and we are going to discuss briefly about each one of them starting with serial extraction so serial extraction look at the definition carefully it is a planned extraction of certain deciduous teeth and later specific permanent teeth in an orderly sequence and predetermined pattern to guide the erupting permanent teeth into a more favorable position so it is involving extraction of certain deciduous teeth also and also some permanent teeth Okay so it's got a long history and just for the important ones the term was actually introduced by Algren in 1929 and Hay Nance is supposed to be the father of serial extraction in United States since it's a very a uh, crude procedure where you're extracting number of teeth that do quite early in the patient's life it might be little traumatic for the patient and it is a long procedure where you are extracting number of deciduous and also permanent teeth so that we need to justify before we do that so why do you think we will need serial extraction so ideally there are some dentitional adjustments that take place both in anteriors and in posteriors if we feel that this adjustment is not happening to the satisfactory level and we anticipate that a malocclusion is going to happen then 
we have to go ahead with serial extraction before the malocclusion actually happens. So let's see what are the natural dentitional adjustments which should ideally take place in the anterior dentition. So if we look at the deciduous incisors there with spacing and small mesodistal width and we compare it with the permanent incisors which are much larger in space with lack of any interdental spacing. This is termed as your incisor liability which should be ideally just 6 to 7 mm. That means if there is a gap of 6 to 7 mm in your deciduous dentition, we know it will be taken care of by the permanent dentition. So everything will be normal in the permanent dentition. So there are various other adjustments also that take place in the anteriors. One is your intercanine arch width is going to increase by about 3 to 4 mm. Plus there is going to be interdental spacing of 2 to 3 mm in your primary anteriors. And also your permanent teeth are going to erupt 1 to 2 mm in front of your primary teeth. So all this will help accommodate the increased mesodistal width of your permanent anteriors compared to your primary and hence there should ideally be no malocclusion if your incisor liability is about 6 to 7 mm. The problem is going to set in when your incisor liability is more than 6 to 7 mm and then you know you have to go ahead for serial extraction to intercept your malocclusion to set in. So you have to be smart enough to guess whether your incisal liability will be more than 6 to 7 mm or not. Of course there are certain signs apart from experience which is required and I'll tell you the particular conditions in which you know that your incisal liability has gone ahead 6 to 7 mm and the patient needs serial extraction. So what are the adjustments that should ideally take place in the posterior dentition? So this is our deciduous dentition. You have A, B, C, D, E, both are an upper and lower arch that I've shown and you have the underlying permanent tooth parts as following. As you can see, the first permanent molar is independently going to erupt. It is not a succedaneous tooth. It's going to erupt independent of any other deciduous tooth on top of it. Rest are having teeth below it. Okay, so ideally what should happen if you compare the size of C, D and E with the underlying canine and both first and second premolars, you can see that the size of the permanent teeth is smaller than the size of the deciduous teeth it's going to replace. Okay, so first thing that happens is our first permanent molar erupts into the occlusal table. Then our anteriors are going to shed. Permanent anteriors will erupt. Followed by deciduous canine shedding and permanent canine erupting. Remember, I am showing the animations for the lower arch. So permanent canine is erupting before the premolars erupt. Then finally, I have my D being shed. First premolar erupting. E being shed and second premolar erupting. And you see that excess space in the arch which is left. This excess space which is left in the arch is more in the lower arch compared to the upper arch which helps in the mesial shift or drift of the dentition and it helps in carrying a first permanent molar in front mesially. Thus, the end-on molar relationship or the flush terminal plane which was prevalent in the mixed or in the primary dentition is now getting converted to a class 1 molar relationship. So this mismatch in the mesodistal width is extremely important for you to get an ideal occlusion. So if you see this mismatch is less than what it should be then you know you're going to have a malocclusion that means the molar relationship might not be ideal so basically this is what is termed as your class one molar relationship so your leeway space is being utilized by the molars and hence you get a class one relationship but what if your leeway space is utilized by anteriors instead to compensate for your incisor liability then also there is going to be a malocclusion setting in because the leeway space, the extra space has been utilized by the anteriors and hence the molar will not get a chance to mesialize and it will be held back and hence you will be ending in a distal step relationship rather than a flush terminal plane and a distal step relationship will end up in a full-blown class 2 malocclusion in an adult and hence there is going to be a malocclusion setting in. So we have to be smart enough to judge when our anterior and posterior adjustments are not going to happen and plan our serial extraction before this actually sets in. 
Now, the question that comes into our mind is why are we planning of serial extraction? That means number of extraction of deciduous followed by permanent teeth. Why not expand the arch and try to accommodate the extra teeth? Because it's the crowding or the molar relationship which will actually need space. So we can resort for other methods of gaining space like expansion, especially in a growing individual, then why not? Why go ahead with a crude procedure like extraction? Yes, uh, expansion is an important method of gaining space, but the point is it is a good idea to go ahead with expansion only if you have a class 2 mal occlusion. It is not a good idea to go ahead with expansion in a class 1 mal occlusion because it leads to muscle imbalance and an unstable orthodontic result. So the key is in class 1 mal occlusion, if you have space discrepancy setting in, then you have to go for serial extraction not expansion. It's as simple as, I would like to explain with this example, big house on a small foundation can never be stable. Remember with the foundation, I am referring to this green color platform on which a house is sitting. So this green color platform is uh, synonymous to your uh, bone and the house is your dentition. So if your if you are having a class 1 skeletal base, class 1 bone, that means you have an ideal or a small uh, bone and your house is big, that means you have crowded dentition and it is not being accommodated on your small base, class 1 base. Okay, if you expand your house further then your base is already small, you have class 1 bone then your relationship will become highly unstable hence it is not advisable whereas class 2 skeletal base means a big maxilla a big jawbone and hence you can expand the house or the dentition also in class 2 skeletal base and both of them will match in size your house that means your dentition with your platform foundation or your bone so just in case I choose to expand, you can see in a class 1 skeletal base, if I expand this dentition, thinking that I will align it by expansion rather than doing multiple extractions, you can see in the second picture on the right that the dentition has come too much buccal and labial and it has come outside of the alveolar bone. Remember, the dentition would be stable and have enough blood supply only if it is in the spongiosa, in the center of the alveolar bone. If the teeth hit the cortex outside of the bone, there'll be no blood supply and they'll not be viable enough. Also, as it approaches more labial and buccal, it becomes closer to your cheek and the lip muscles and very prone to be collapsed by their forces again and again and leading to a contraction of the arch and hence a relapse of what you have done. So clinically, what are the clues which tell you that your anterior and posterior adjustments are not good enough and that you have to go for serial extraction? Are, of course, if you see severe arch length tooth size discrepancy, that means you have extreme crowding being visible in the mixed dentition. Or instead of crowding, sometimes you will see flaring or proclined dentition, which is also a sign that the space is insufficient for the teeth to align themselves. A very typical sign is a premature loss of a deciduous canine. That means your permanent anteriors are not getting enough space and they have, they have actually led to resorption of the primary canine's root which has led to its initial exfoliation, a premature exfoliation. So there is a tooth size arch length discrepancy. Or the canine has not shed prematurely, however the incisor has not got enough space and the lateral incisors have typically erupted lingually. Or the permanent canines are not getting enough space and they are erupting measly over the lateral incisors. So these are the signs that there is severe arch length tooth size discrepancy in your patient and you might need to go ahead with serial extraction. So this one is already covered. Which jaw relationships are you going to go ahead with for serial extraction? So we are not going to deal with class 2 or class 3 because we can resort to other methods of gaining space in them. Your serial extraction is indicated in class 1 skeletal bases only. So if we talk about the technique according to 
the various minimal change in the sequence of the tooth you are going to choose to extract. Three different authors have given three different methods of serial extraction. You have Devil's Tweeds and Nance method. So in the Devil's method, if you see, we are going to start by removal of C. Then the anteriors will adjust themselves, followed by extraction of D leading to eruption of your first premolars and once they are erupted we are going to extract them once they are extracted the permanent canines will erupt then your premolars and you have a full nice set in class one malocclusion then you have a modified wells method wherein you remove the c then Again, your anteriors will align into that space, so your anterior crowding will never set in. Then you remove your D. And then rather than waiting for the first premolar to erupt and then extract it, you're going to enucleate the first premolar itself right then. You'll not be waiting for them to erupt. Then again, your canines will erupt smoothly and your second premolars as well. And there'll be a nice, perfect class one malocclusion setting in. Then you have your tweeds method. This is a reversal of method. That means we start not from C, rather we start from D. So you remove the D and then your first premolars are going to erupt. Then you remove this first premolar along with the C. Then your anteriors will align and also the posterior adjustment will take place leading into a perfect class one. So before we plan for any serial extraction, there are three things we must ask yourself. Is the discrepancy so severe that the teeth will not find room on their own? Are both parents and the patients aware that serial extraction is going to continue for a period of about four to five years waiting for a planned extraction of deciduous teeth followed by certain permanent teeth? And remember, it is not a fixed procedure. Sometimes the orthodontist might have to change the plan depending upon your eruption sequence, which might be different in different individuals. So next we move on to the next interceptive procedure, which is correction of anterior crossbite. So if you look at the crossbite, it means normally your upper anterior should be labial or in front of the mandibular anteriors here you have a re reverse relationship where your mandibular anteriors instead are labeled to the maxillary anteriors so this is what is termed as a anterior cross bite if this happens then the entire maxilla can be restrained from growing because it is getting locked inside your mandible and remember According to your cephalocaudal gradient of growth, if maxilla is locked inside and it is not relieved at the correct age early, the maxillary growth stops also at an early age. It starts and stops early. So if you are too late by the time you relieve this cross by, the maxilla will not have any growth left. And this dental problem might actually become a skeletal problem where the maxilla would not have grown and mandible would continue to grow, grow and grow later in life. And the patient would actually become a skeletal class 3 when the problem was just a dental cross bite maybe the wrong inclination of the upper teeth or the flared lower teeth. Okay. That's why the best time to treat a crossbite is the moment you see it. It is an extremely important interceptive procedure which can save you from getting any skeletal problem in the future and going ahead with surgical orthodontics at a later age. So your correction of crossbite can be done depending upon the etiology of the crossbite with which the patient is presenting. So if the crossbite is dentoalveolar in nature, that means it's only the dentition which is at fault, which has led to a reverse anterior relationship, then you correct the dentition accordingly, depending upon the cause. So suppose it is the anteriors which are retroclined, the maxillary anterior. So our point will be to push the upper anterior outside. So this is called your tongue blade. It's like an ice cream stick. So you ask the patient to continuously push the upper incisor 
in front using the lower anterior as a fulcrum. So if this is done continuously with time your upper anterior inclination will become positive and it will come in front of your lower anterior you will have a positive overjet. If the compliance of the patient is doubtful then we can go ahead with a Catalan appliance instead where you are going to cement a lower anterior inclined plane which will have a particular inclination like this. So suppose the patient is presenting like this with an anterior cross bite. You cement this inclined plane on the lower and the glide, the incline will glide the upper anterior in front into a positive overjet. So with time when you remove this appliance, the patient will end up with a positive overbite and overjet. Sometimes it is a single tooth inclination which is not correct and it is lingually placed in that case to push that particular tooth labially this is a z spring that you can give in a removable appliance if you look at this picture the particular lateral incisor is lingually placed compared to the other teeth so you make a z spring you activate both the coils and it will lead to a pushing effect onto the lateral incisor and correct the inclination and hence correct the anterior cross bite the z spring is something that you make for your preclinical exercise as well Next, what if the cross bite is functional in nature, then it is called as pseudo class 3. That means it is only during a particular function. That means opening and closing of the jaw or the lateral movement of the jaw that a cross bite is appearing, but actually the cross bite is not there. So it leads to a pseudo class 3. That means the patient is not actually class 3, but appears to be class 3 in nature only during function. But if it continues to happen over a longer period of time, then remember functional matrix theory. With altered function, the bone will also grow and the patient will actually become class 3. So we need to intercept this abnormal function at the correct time. And there can be various reasons for it. It can be tonsils, occlusal prematurities or any high filling which has been done which is gliding and forcing the patient to bite in a forward position when the mandible is being opened. So our point is to remove, remove the etiology and correct the functional cross bite the moment we see it. So this is a video. If you can see. So the, the moment patient opens and closes, the moment he is bringing the mandible in occlusion, just before that there is a forward glide of the mandible. So this is called a functional cross bite. So the moment the teeth are brought into occlusion in contact, there is a glide which is making the lower teeth go in a forward position and bite. So we need to find out the etiology of this glide or the forward shift of the mandible and correct the respective etiology. So the next problem can be that the cross bite is actually skeletal in nature. So before it worsens, Right now, since the patient is growing, we can intercept and decrease the severity, modulate the growth of the individual, the particular jaw base which is at fault and correct it. So a cross bite can be because the maxilla is not being able to grow or the mandible is growing too much. So we have to control that at an early age. Otherwise, once the growth is over, the only option that will be left to correct a skeletal problem will be surgery, surgical orthodontics. So let's see as a part of interceptive orthodontics how can we correct a skeletal anterior cross bite where we can give something like this to the patient. We take support from the forehead and the chin. So you can see elastics here being attached onto the maxillary dentition which will help you pull the maxilla out taking support from the forehead and mandible also having mild restraining effect on the mandible. Hence, any skeletal cross bite can be interceptive at this age by giving this particular appliance. This is being given on the facial side of the face and hence it's called a face mask or a reverse pull headgear. If you see inside on the maxilla, you have attachment for the face mask and on the palate, this can be accompanied with a expansion screw which helps you loosen the sutures of the maxilla and cause expansion of the mid palatine sutures. So if you see in the first picture, all the teeth are together, whereas in the second where expansion has actually taken place, lateral expansion, you see a typical midline diastema which has appeared because of the split of the mid palatal suture. So the entire maxilla is loosened from all the sutures around, it is widened and it is also brought forward by these elastics of the face mask. 
and all this can be done only in growing stage. Sec next, we move on to interception of certain habits. This will be dealt with in detail when your lecture on oral habits is taken. But just for a clue, there can be various oral habits which a patient can have like finger sucking, thumb sucking, lip sucking or lip biting and this is your tongue thrusting where you are thrusting the tongue in between your dentition while swallowing. So all these habits lead to an altered buccinator mechanism that means wherein the position of your tongue, the idle position of your tongue is being displaced. And this leads to a malocclusion, an abnormal force onto your dentition. If you want to stop it from happening, you have to give habit breaking appliances. The first one that you see is a tongue crib or tongue rake, you can say. This will prevent the patient from tongue thrusting or thumb sucking because the position where the patient would have positioned the thumb has been taken up by the rake. And if the patient does a tongue thrusting, then the tongue will be hurt by this particular rake present there and hence it will be minimized. The second one you see is a lip bumper where a bumper appliance has been put over here which will interfere with the position of the lip. Lip cannot come inside so no lip sucking can, hap can happen and a gap between the dentition and all the muscles buckled to it has been created. So no muscular habit will be interfered with the dentitional growth. Next, we assume a condition where you have a rotten tooth there and which has led to its premature shedding. And hence, before the erupting permanent tooth can actually erupt in that place, that place has actually been lost by mesialization of the adjacent tooth because remember, all our occlusal forces are mesial in nature. So this is a very natural thing that the space which could have been used for a permanent tooth to erupt has been lost because of a premature shed of the primary tooth. Then what do we do in this case? Before it actually worsens and the permanent tooth inside gets locked there and gets impacted, we need to intercept at an early age and do a space regaining procedure, not space maintaining. Space maintenance, I would have called it if after the removal after the premature shedding of that tooth, I would have given a space maintainer right there and I would have not let any malocclusion to set in. Then that would have been a part of preventive orthodontics. Here, I have let that much malocclusion to set in that the space is lost. But before it worsens, I'm going to intercept at an early age by regaining the space. So there are various types of space regainers. You can have coils, open coils, which are going to squeeze and then push up and open up the space. You can have expansion screws or you can have your finger springs, which will drift the teeth, adjacent teeth into the adjacent areas. These finger springs are again something that you will be making in your preclinical. So this is how a gerber space regainer looks like, which is consisting of a coil which has been compressed from its original shape. And there is an adjacent tooth over there and the coil is going to open up to its original length and hence open up the space by pushing the adjacent tooth like this and the, hence the space will be regained the lost space and the permanent tooth can erupt into that space next we move on to muscle exercises and definitely not this kind so the muscle exercises can be of various uh, oral, oral musculatures like masseter, circumoral or your tongue depending upon which muscle is at fault. So you need to retrain the muscle because muscles are very very important to maintain an equilibrium theory and buccinator mechanism in your oral cavity. So exercise for the masseter muscles will include the clenching of the teeth or you need to count till 10. Exercise for your circumoral muscles will be you stretch your upper lip hold and pump water back and forth or you can do a button pull exercise you pull a button past your lips a tug of war and for tongue muscles you'll have one elastic swallow that means you hold one elastic onto your tongue and then with your tongue you hold it against the palate and you try to swallow with your lips once apart or lips together and you make sure that your elastic stays there if you want to make it more rigorous you can add two elastics and you can ho try holding your tongue exactly there in the midline 
and hold pull exercise so basically various exercises where you are engrossing your tongue muscles next is again a part of it is already been dealt with but just uh, for a recap interception of any skeletal mal relationship so if you feel any skeletal problem is about to set in which is not happening according to the normal norms of your cephalocaudal gradient of growth you must intercept at this age once it is intercepted because if it goes into a full blown skeletal problem then the only thing left once the growth is over for you would be to go ahead with surgical orthodontics to correct the skeletal problem hence this is a very very important part for an orthodontist so suppose you want to intercept a class 2 malocclusion class 2 means maxilla in front mandible behind which can again be because of two reasons it can be maxillary growth at fault or it can be because the mandibular growth is deficient or it it can actually be a combination so depending on that we have to treat the cause at this age before it is too late so we start with the first one where case one we feel the mandible is retronathic and i want to grow the mandible in front so in that case i'm going to give something which is called as a myofunctional appliance which will retrain alter the function and will eventually lead to the mandible growing so i'm going to force the patient to bite in a forward position continuously by giving an appliance in this particular animation it is the twin block appliance that i've chosen so the patient is having class 2 malocclusion twin block means it is available in two pairs one block will be given in upper one lower the upper is also fitted with a expansion screw so it will also cause expansion so this has got a incline over there with that incline the mandible is being forced to bite in a forward position so continuously the patient bites in that forward position apart from that this is an expansion screw so you are going to use the screw and expand the arch so your mid palatal suture split will also happen and eventually you're going to trim these blocks so that the patient becomes comfortable and the teeth can erupt into this space and you have a perfect class 1 because you made the patient bite in a forward position for such a long time for about 1 or 2 years till the time growth was left that actually the class 2 becomes class 1 mandible grows and becomes orthodontic and later on braces will be required if dental correction is needed so we move on to case 2 where your class 2 skeletal base or your problem is actually because of maxilla being too much in front and our aim is that we want to restrict the growth of maxilla by pulling it behind so there are various ways you can pull it behind we are going to pull it behind by a headgear appliance so you can pull it let's have a look at the video okay so this patient is class 2 skeletal base with a class 2 molar relationship i can put braces and along with that i am taking support from the back of the neck this is a cervical pull headgear and i pull the maxilla straight behind okay so depending upon which way i want to pull and i make the patient look class 1 so i'm restricting the growth of maxilla or i can pull the maxilla up and behind like this so this is a high pull headgear where i want to correct the overbite also so not just behind i want to pull the maxilla up and behind because probably the patient has a gummy smile also so i'm doing both sagittal and vertical relationship correction the way i want to pull the maxilla behind is what i am changing here i am pulling it up and down both ways so it's called a combi pull so in between my vector is somewhere here in between of these two so vertically i want the maxilla to be pulled behind like this so it will change depending upon the patient's growth pattern and the overbite okay the detail of it will be told to you when you are dealing with orthopedic appliances now similarly i just like i told you about class 2 malocclusion you need to intercept class 3 malocclusion as well which can again be because maxilla is deficient in growth or mandible is growing too much or it can be a combination and this i've already told you you can either use a face mask appliance where you are taking support from your forehead and your chin and you pull your maxilla out by these elastics and inside you can also cause expansion of the maxilla split the suture which will loosen the maxilla so that it can easily be brought forward or rather than having the entire face mask you can also just have a chin cup if only your mandible is at fault again do not worry too much you are going to have detailed 
lecture on your orthopedic and myofunctional appliances. Next, we move on to the last procedure, which is removable or removal of any soft tissue and bony barrier, which is coming on the way of your tooth, which has to erupt. So if that is the case, till the time that eruptive potential is present in the tooth bud, you need to act fast and remove that particular soft tissue or bone on that particular tooth so that it can erupt. So you have to surgically expose that tooth remove any barrier which is not letting it erupt and which can lead to its impaction later on when no growth potential will be left. So here you bond an attachment also orthodontically and I have tied it down onto the occlusal plane, the wire which is present and I'm pulling it out for a faster result rather than just relying on natural eruption of tooth. And that's the end. So all of you, I hope the lecture was... Uh, clear to everybody if not feel free to ask any questions you want and be ready for a short quiz following this so stay safe and keep reading